Becky. Man, I was doing so well with it too. OK, I'm going to let the recording kind of it. Anytime I click that button, it takes it a little second to think about its life. And so I'm going to let teams think about its life and its decisions for a second to make sure that you guys have the best viewing experience possible. OK. Here we go. All right, now, Paul, you have to do the thumbs up again. <laughs> Take two. My ultimate goal is to see the Dakota Skippers reestablished out here. This prairie is unlike any other prairie in our work area, just because of the topography, the sheer amount of remnant prairie we have, and the partnerships we have going on right now too. It just makes it a fun place to be. Dakota Skippers are ones that most people have never seen before. They're little butterflies that are about a little bigger than the size of your thumbnail, orange and brown. Um, and they bounce around the prairies. They get their names skippers by their flight of skipping around the prairie. So Dakota skippers are small butterflies, but they've got big stories to tell. They have been bouncing around these prairies for eons, as long as we as long as there has been prey here, there have been Dakota skippers here. And their disappearance from this prairie and others in the past are indicators that probably lots of other things have been declining too. If we can make and bring back better prairie for Dakota skippers, that's going to make and bring back prairie and better habitat and, wild, and for, for uh, lots of other kinds of wildlife. A lot of the other songbirds that are around right now they rely on insects to feed their offspring. The game birds are depending on the prairie and the insects and, and a lot of the other kind of plant wildlife that's out here. And so when we can make better prairie, that's gonna have a lot of benefits. So Dakota skippers need wildflowers, not blooming right now, but the purple cone flowers, they need as caterpillars to feed on the native grasses, these bunch grasses, like porcupine grass here, uh, prairie drop seed, a lot of the other native deep, uh, deep rooted bunch grasses um, is what their caterpillars eat. So Dakota skippers are adults for a few weeks of the year, midsummer right now, um, last week in June, first week in July usually. But that's the only time of the year that we've ever actually seen them in the wild. <laughs> Most of the time, um, they are actually caterpillars feeding on these prairie grasses in front of me. And we've never seen that ever in the wild, but we know that's what they're doing because that's what we've seen them doing at the Minnesota Zoo. Um, and so they, their eggs for about a week to 10 days, then caterpillars for about 11 months, pupa for a about 12 days and then adults for two weeks. Prairie is a surprisingly complex system. There are hundreds of species that are out here interacting with each, with each other. We don't fully understand all of those systems, but um, certainly having a strong diverse component of the grasses and of wildflowers are going to be providing rich resilient systems that um, are going to be helping us and helping wildlife. So the whole of mountain wildlife management area and then the adjacent Altona wildlife management area are areas that have had Dakota skippers in the past. They were here as recently as 2009. And in the hills far behind me is the Nature Conservancy's Hole in the Mountain Prairie Preserve. And We've been reintroducing Dakota skippers there for now the last several years, and we want to expand them into these, all of these ridges, all of these upland high quality prairies so that we can reestablish this lost population. Having them in one place is not enough. We need resiliency. Uh, we need them to be able to, to sustain themselves in these prairies like they had been for so many years. We want to understand what is needed to be able to bring them back. 
Reintroductions of Dakota skippers prior to this effort have never been done before. And so in some ways, this is very much a learning process too. Um, and the hope is that if we can figure out what it takes to get dots back on the map, get Dakota skippers back on the map, that will allow us to help figure out the conditions needed to connect those dots. First, we want to get them back on the map, then to use science to help learn the conditions and, and the, the properties of what makes good prairie and connected prairie. This is a really unique opportunity to integrate um, the science of, of prairie management in terms of fire and in terms of grazing with um, bringing back butterflies. We, we need to be able to restore the system and this is providing us the, a unique opportunity to, to do that right here at the Holman Mountain WMA. My role is, is variable depending on the, the situation. It's in part to help connect the pieces, to help connect the zoo with the Fish and Wildlife Service that we work very closely with, with DNR managers, um, other folks like non-game biologists, regional biologists help connect everybody, but also to help monitor the, the population. So typically I um, monitor the other Dakota skipper population in Clay County, um, but also want to help monitor what's going on here and make sure these, um, we know about what, how they're doing. So to monitor Dakota skippers, we, um, we do a variety of things. One of the goals that we have is to assess abundance. Um, and it's a tricky thing to do for a, a rare species that's hard to find. Um, has a what we call a low detection probability. We have, it's, they're hard to find. So um, we, we walk transects and we measure the distance. Uh, once we see a Dakota skipper, we measure the distance from the Dakota skipper to the transect we're on. And we can then use that to model um, their abundance. My fear is that, that it's not going to work, you know, there's a lot of energy going into this and um, thankfully that's, that's buffered by a lot of really solid planning so that if it, if it does fail, we'll still learn from, from what we're doing and learn more about how to do it better. My favorite part is certainly the thrill I get every time I see a Dakota skipper. Um, you know, you, you walk a lot of miles and you don't see a lot of Dakota skippers and because they're rare and you see one and yes, I got it. Um, but also uh, working with these people are, is pretty fabulous. Um, being able to work with Eric and um, work with the people at the Fish and Wildlife Service and all my DNR colleagues. There's hope. And that you have all these people, all these partners, you know, it's that power of prairie partnerships, you know, that no one person has all the resources or expertise, but we all come together because of our, our desire to make a difference and our passion. And that, that's pretty exciting. We hope you've enjoyed this program and that you've enjoyed a lot about the partnership that's going on here at Hole in the Mountain. It wouldn't happen without every piece of this partnership working together. In Minnesota, we have 235,000 acres of prairie left. Remnant prairie, unbroken virgin prairie that looks like what I imagine Laura Ingalls Wilder saw when she came out onto the prairie. To have a job where you can come out and work with amazing people, learn from each other, and be on a prairie like this, that's something that's pretty special indeed. So while 2020 was a hard year, we also learned a lot that if you give nature space and time and thoughtful management, it can recover. We just have to find a way to get better in balance. And that's what we're trying to do out here at Hole in the Mountain. There's a lot to learn if we just look at the land itself. And the prairie has stories that it is just waiting to tell us. I'm proud that we get to do this together because that's what prairie is all about.
I give myself a moment there, get some tissues when I see us all high fiving like that. It's just so nice. Love all these people. Oh gosh. OK, so feel free. Like I said, um, we have a we had a lot of questions earlier um, about Dakota skippers and about considerations in our management for them. And so we want to make sure that now that we've got the zoo here with us that we ask them all of our great questions. So just a reminder to type your questions in the chat or just unmute yourself. I mean, we're all friends here now. Just unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm going to give you guys a moment. I know that was a very touching end to the video. So it takes a moment to pivot and recover. When were the Dakota Skippers first reintroduced to Hole in the Mountain? Hey, so yeah, um, thanks. That's a good question. So in the the effort began in the greater Hole in the Mountain complex in 2017. Um, when we began the first set of reintroductions on the TNC side of the land uh, just across the road. Um, this last year was the first year of, of reintroductions at the WMA. Um, and the area in general, the, the greater Hole in the Mountain complex was chosen because um, it was actually a, we weighed a lot of different factors. Um, it's not just enough to have a thousand or more skippers being produced at the zoo each year. You know, they need to have a home, right? Um, and in the wild. And so we went through a process in 2016 and 2017 trying to determine where might be the best areas for this. And that's weighing a lot of biological factors, weighing a lot of social factors, um, logistics, you know, all those things. And there's multiple, you know, there's a couple 50 page documents we kind of wrote <laughs> going through the, the process and developing the plan. Um, so we we initially we, we chose the whole mountain complex because it is a large set of, of prairies that are remnant that are remaining um, and they historically maintained pretty solid populations of Dakota skippers. We don't exactly know why they disappeared and that's that's still a, a kind of a good open question. We suspect like with most endangered and rare species that it's it's not a simple answer that there's probably lots of interacting things of why they may have disappeared in the first place. Um, certainly the isolation is a factor um, for for most for Dakota skippers in particular, they are they're pretty good homebodies, and so they kind of like to stay on the on the ridges that they are they were born upon. Um, and certainly, so what you know, the next prairie is fifteen miles away. You know, they're just not going to be able to, to communicate with each other that way. And we knew that this is an area that had the ability for uh, to be able to maintain essentially a kind of a meta population type of a complex there. Um, and we also know that there's a lot of good prairie. So we wanted to be able to utilize um, utilize the landscape in a way that we can also explore some of these management tactics to understand the effects of, say, what is the effect of a bird or what is the, what is, what is the effect of cattle here to um, better integrate and, and use this as a learning process because to go to skipper reintroductions really had never been done before. So even if we are not successful, we are hoping to be able to learn what might be important factors to promote success. Um, and so as was um, stated in some of these other great modules that we, we hope to be able to um, utilize as much information as possible and much as much science as possible to make inferences because it's not just enough to have them on the landscape it's it's more about being able to bring them back to as many places as possible um, and to be able to reconnect those dots so um, yeah the whole the mountain area is just it's special it's got so much nice prairie it has a lot of really great managers that re that's that's a really important piece of the buy-in as well so, yeah. 
Great. I have a few here um, that are coming to me directly. So what came first, cows or Dakota skippers? Um, is it was it because Dakota skipper was compatible with cows that you chose hole in the mountain or were cows brought in to help make things suitable for Dakota skippers? And I'm going to copy this question into the chat for you because when they're three part questions, I always remember the first part and then I forget the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and so that way you can you can see that there. Good one. Um, the Holman WMA provides the opportunity to be able to understand. So the cows came first here. Um, the cows were were a, a tool on the landscape to understand the management techniques needed to promote better prairie. Um, and we know that we have to be able to um, the prairies have to be managed um, to beat back the burrow and things like that. Um, we know that if uh, we the you know, we humans have removed otherwise the natural disturbance processes so we we are going to have to be able to to go in and do some things we wanted to use this as an opportunity with this wma to to learn from how varieties of techniques of, for habitat management can can influence reintroduction success um one of the the this wma is not alone though because we actually have a control um, because we also did another set of very similar releases a couple of miles down the road at the Altona WMA where there is no real there was no world management it was um, it's a it's another nice piece of this larger complex um, but it that does not have the same sort of management technique so we can compare next year and then into future years what populations are like um, of Dakota skippers in these areas and we can we can hopefully make some inferences that way. Perfect. So, um, there's a few more here. Oh, did you? Sorry. Uh, no, that I just was... want to make sure okay. um, that I'm I'm adequately covering all of those those three bullet points there. I hope I did. If you not, did. speak up. And then uh, Amanda, that's right, Amanda doesn't have a mic, so I have to be Amanda. Is the zoo planning to release Dakota skippers at other sites in Minnesota? And what's your overall plan? I'm adding on to Amanda's question. <laughs> what's your overall plan for next year? Yes, we um, are going to be continuing releases. Um, we probably only have the capacity to really do kind of one area per year. <laughs> um, we are, we have another, um, large batch of Dakota skippers this year that are likely going to be going back somewhere within the greater complex of, of Hole in the Mountain next year. Um, and the, the precise location of that is still under discussion. Uh, that's our winter discussion topic. Um, probably onto the TNC side so that we can look at kind of the effect of a one year release on the WMAs. Um, but that's still TBD. And then in 2023, uh, we're going to be releasing at another new site at Glacial Lakes State Park in central Minnesota. Um, and there we hope to be able to learn what the effects of, of floral variation might have on Dakota skippers. So we know, for example, that echinacea is a super important um, nectar source. It seems to be their preferred when it's there. Um, but it's probably not the only thing that they're interested in. And we're also especially interested in kind of what are densities of cone flowers that might be needed or other floral resources. Um, what's the spatial configuration for that that's going to be important for them? We hope to be able to, or we're going to be um, releasing to go to skippers in a, you know, actually four different locations within that park next year in 2023. Um, and looking at their responses to experimental manipulations and floor densities and especially augmentations. <clears throat> um, so that's that's all very exciting and that's going to be done as, as part of Emily Royer's PhD thesis um, coming up. So yes, we are planning other uh, releases. We don't have explicit plans beyond 2023, but we certainly expect the program to be continuing and are very interested in at what other additional opportunities might but I'd be there. Perfect. And I'm just going to share um, a map here so folks can see this. 
Um, I hate how everything goes away when I try, when I try to do simple things. Um, this is just a map showing the release at Hole in the Mountain this year. And so I apologize, I can't zoom in on that anymore. But Jess, do you just want to speak a little bit to what these different dots mean? The, the uh, orange-ish triangles are Dakota skippers that we observed on the transects that we walked. And the white circles are Dakota skippers that we observed just as we were wandering around. So it's an extent of about from the release point, um, which Megan can point to right, right about there. Yeah, it's an extent of about 150 meters in, in a couple. Perfect, thank you. I just wanted to give people a, a visual so they could see how how the release kind of happened there. All right, we've got a bunch more questions for you. Dave, do you want to give voice to your question in the chat? Sure, I was just wondering where you got your original um, Dakota skippers, uh, the individuals to start your program with. Yep. Um, everybody that was released at this WMA are derived actually from um, kind of the northern end of the Prairie Coteau in northeastern South Dakota on some tribal land, which is actually managed by haying almost exclusively um, and, and maintains some of the better populations really in the world. Um, and so, yes, they didn't come from Minnesota, but they came from the same ecological landform and it's basically the same habitat. Sure, thank you. Perfect, okay, we have a few um, more for you. What do we know about the outcome of the Nature Conservancy release or the release at Hole in the Mountain and Altona this year? Yep, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, and so we actually didn't release any on the TNC property this year so that we could start evaluating the legacy of success. Um, we did four years of releases on the TNC property <clears throat> um, in, in this, their kind of central unit, um, which is a similar ridge that's actually the ridge right behind me in my picture <laughs> um each year releasing between 300 and five or 600 individuals um and we are seeing them do all the things we hope that they would be doing um we see them utilizing the the kinds of habitats that we think are the the optimal habitat for them we see them um mating in the wild we've seen mating in the wild we've seen them laying eggs and that we know some of those eggs are viable so they're they're doing all the right things um <clears throat> we are also hoping to be able to to see kind of growth we, we're seeing them moving on to some other adjacent ridges which is which is nice so one of the monitoring tactics is to understand not only persistence on the landscape but but kind of spread on the landscape, which might indicate a, a growing population size. For the first couple of years of the releases, we were doing it in a way that made it a little hard, um, and this was intentional, to, to understand exactly who was who, because of, we, so we would bring out a batch of three or 400 uh, pupa per year, and they, they, we let them emerge in the prairie, into uh, reach adulthood in the prairie, so that they're kind of, in sync and and they're just able to go about their business right away so that requires us to basically open up a box and let the new adults go every day but it doesn't provide an opportunity for marking um and we are able to um provide them kind of a really safe environment up until that point but once they're out you know we we hope that they're they're doing their thing um in 20 but that what that did make it hard in at least the first couple of years was to know exactly who was who and to, so we are doing surveys like just talked about um but we couldn't always tell which ones are which like which ones are releases from that year versus the progeny of a prior year's reintroduction um until 2020 actually when we were able to see um we were able to, to kind of change our scheme a little bit and develop the, this thing called the party tent where we it's basically a cube of a, a six by foot six foot cube of, of, of a mesh cage um that we 
plunked over the prairie and put our our new batch of, of emerging skippers in there. And then we're able to do some transect surveys or roaming around the prairie where we've done prior releases. Um, and there we were able to see multiple individuals that were clearly the result of the previous year's reintroduction. So we know they're beginning. And unfortunately, the, the year we decided as, as planned to not do any new releases was also the 2021 epic drought, <laughs> um, which made conditions really hard. And I'm um, I'm hopeful that they're going to be able to, you know, do be doing their things after that. Um, but conditions were really, really hard, um, especially in that beginning and middle of August or uh, July, where we're where the the grasses that they really seem to want, which are things like prairie, porcupine grass and prairie drop seed, especially, um, were were pretty pretty gray, um, and there wasn't a lot of green material. For anything really a lot of the the species just kind of like sat out the year a lot of the plants just kind of sat out the year especially and some of the flora plants too so we were you're we seeing them do those things in the wild we did see still a couple of individuals in that tnc unit um this last year too so fingers crossed that that conditions are still going to be okay this next year and that those rains when they did start coming in middle and later half of July were enough to to kind of get the cat the new batch of caterpillars through um, we were able to see this year and this year's release them doing basically the same thing um, all those markers that we want them to do rearing and breeding and we actually brought out some of our individuals a little later than we normally would because there weren't a lot of blooming flowers in the prairie um, at the time because the drought, a lot of the perennial wildflowers kind of sat out for a while. So we actually retained more of them at the zoo a little longer until adulthood and we actually were able to breed a bunch of them too. Um, and then let those individuals go and then some of their larvae go as well. So we ended up releasing over 1300 um, skippers out in between the two WMAs this year. Uh, between the adults and then some of their their larvae, so um, we certainly put a lot out, and I'm I'm hopeful that this next year is going to be enough. That will that this is the next year is really going to be able to tell the story of success. I like I like hearing you say that. Next year we're going to tell the story of success. That's, <laughs> That's optimism. Right. I like it. And I'm just showing the map here, just again, because I know not everybody is familiar with this landscape. I know this is a busy map, so I just want to walk you through it real quick. Everything outlined in red, where I'm also moving my cursor in case you happen to be somebody who's like, I can't see red, don't know what she's talking about. Um, this is the wildlife management area, and then it grades right into everything outlined in blue, where I'm moving my cursor here, which is the Nature Conservancy Preserve. Both of them called Hole in the Mountain, so it's not confusing at all. So when you are working um, within these agencies, typically refer, we refer to the Nature Conservancy site as the preserve, and the other one is just called him, <laughs> Hole in the Mountain. So if you want to be cool, now you can use our lingo. But you can see also everything that is yellow in here where I'm kind of moving my cursor. This is all unbroken remnant prairie. And so that it's a it's a pretty impressive complex. And we've been working diligently to fill in those pieces also with reconstruction. So again, just wanted to give you a little context. Becky, do you want to give voice to your question? Uh, Becky, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I had somebody at the door and then the dog was barking, of course, at the same time. Um, I can't remember. Hi, Eric. I can't remember exactly where the reconstructions, the prairie reconstructions are situated um, in reference to the, the remnant prairies or the entire complex. Do you expect to I guess see the skippers disperse and utilize the reconstruction ultimately, or can you speak more to the role that reconstructions may play into Dakota skipper reintroductions? I guess specifically here at Hole in the Mountain, and then maybe elsewhere as we are looking into the future. Yep, yep. That's that's really kind of that that will if we are able to figure out the, those conditions, that's going to be the path forward for Dakota skipper recovery, I think. Um, we don't know the effect of reconstructions because it's never been attempted for Dakota skippers yet. We're only trying to get them back into the, the really nice pockets that we knew about, but we're hoping that we can be 
able to be getting into that in the next year. So, for example, Nature Conservancy is in the, is in the process of of trying to expand the and initiate a new reconstruction within this complex. Um, I would love to be able to get towards that. And I think the we're learning more and more about some of the biological components. Um, so the grasses that they really like, and this is done through especially a uh, Gail Nordmeyer's master's project on, on host grass usage, um, at least under controlled zoo settings and what works really well there. Um, we're hoping to be able to learn the floral needs through this um, ex experiment that we're doing at the Glacial Lake State Park. But um, I'm optimistic that if we are able to be reconstructing prairies in a way that, that mimic those, those processes, I think it's going to be possible. Um, I would, yeah, I think, I think it, it has a lot of potential. Um, the, the main trick in the beginning is just to make sure that we can keep them re persisting in, re-persisting in their historic sites too. Okay, going down, I have to skip past. Uh, Brandon, do you wanna give voice to your question? I always do this to you and then <laughs> put you on the spot. Sure, so I've got a little helper with me. Um, so just curious if you could elaborate a little bit on any thoughts about neonicotinoids and what their effects might be on the skippers and how that might have informed your um, relocation and translocation efforts. Yeah, so the role of pesticides is a huge one and probably is, is one of those contributing drivers towards declines. Um, for the last now eight years, we've actually been collecting um, in, uh, data on pesticide residues on the grasses that the skippers eat. Um, and I'm in the process of trying to get all that published. <laughs> it's my winter goal. Um, where we sent, we would basically clip the the grasses, and they're they're sent off to a to a lab, and we get we get back results of of what's there on the grasses and of a couple hundred different kinds of of compounds, um, including neonics. And the pattern that's emerging out of this, we did this both in spring, but especially have been doing it in the kind of the later part of summer. Um, in the spring, we weren't finding much. Um, in the summer, we were especially finding. Um, actually not neonics, but pesticides that are being applied against soybean aphids. So chlorpyrifos, the organophosphate, and the couple pyrethroids, and a lot of fungicides. Um, not always in the hugest amounts, but certainly there are some things that are like, okay, that's that's 10 times or, or 100 times the amount documented that's in theory kind of the, the level to kill a honeybee, at least in a lab test. Um, usually it's le far less than that. We don't know exactly what those risks are associated with that, but it's a pretty consistent signal. Um, Dakota skippers are, as I mentioned in my talk, that they're um, usually, we, we only see them for a couple weeks of the year. We don't see them as, as, as larvae in the wild. That's, I don't think, ever been done, except the ones where we are intentionally putting them there and then relooking at that exact plant <laughs> with the pin flag, right? Um, so a wild that's go to skipper that's go to skipper, yeah, has never been found as a caterpillar. Uh, but we do know from, from rearing them that they actually form a, a little volcano-shaped structure at the base of their host plant. Um, and they live inside these little tubes and then will crawl up snip off a piece of grass, pull it down, and then munch it down inside their little tube. So they're actually pretty well protected inside those little tubes. It's just a matter of like, is the amount probably that's landing on their grasses going to be pr promoting a risk um, to them? The That is a, a good experiment. We we actually tried a little bit. Um, we're where we actually we then sprayed some grasses with some one of those uh, pyrethroids and that had a caterpillar on it um dakota skippers but also one of the surrogate species and tried to under or look at kind of then survivorship through time we well i i want to do it again for statistical power but basically there there may be some times when we do see some mortality occurring from that in the wild um 
but generally it it's uh it's a tricky prospect um and it's one that deserves a lot of extra research uh, and that'll just add that there, we don't really find a correlation with like geography um in these the, they're kind of anywhere you're looking there's little bits of it on these that are five or, or 15 or 20 parts per billion level uh, for almost all of these compounds um, existing in the prairies and that's not just here it's it's basically everywhere we've looked all of the prairies <laughs> unfortunately so we've been looking now at seven different prairies in, in minnesota over the years i don't know how to get around that um, it's it, it's a fact of life out there and what that risk is is the key question excellent question hard truths eric good questions yep. good answers yep. um jess or so, excuse me jessica do you want to give voice to your question i think we'll punt it to amber and then we'll go back to eric uh we'll give you <laughs> give you a moment eric <laughs> little break yeah, my question, um, listening to how close, I definitely don't know the whole um, area, but seeing how close everything is, how much collaboration do you guys do with what TNC is doing, what DNR is doing? Like, how do you tie of like, you did tried that, that worked, you tried that, that worked, this did not work. Like, how much interaction is between the two agencies? I don't know if it's so much who tried what, but it's more along the lines of just coordinating efforts of who's going to be burning where or where the management's going to be happening each year. So that way we're not taking so much of that habitat away from that skipper that's now re reintroduced out there. So year long talks, I think we started last year with talks about reintroducing it onto the WMAs and then that further proceeded to talks with TNC about where they're burning, where they're hanging at, where I'm grazing at. And even what's going on down on the Altona WMA with that manager. So it's it's a collaborative effort because we still want to benefit that skipper. We have it out there on the landscape and we want to make sure that it's going to hopefully stay out there. So. Absolutely. Great response. Great question. Joseph, do you want to give voice to your question? And that will go to Eric. Uh, sure. Hi, Eric. Um, I just wondered if you'd looked at any other species of skippers that might be still present in decent numbers and maybe have, have you been able to determine what allowed them to survive or persist where the Dakota skippers have not? Uh, yeah, so we are doing, as we were doing all these surveys, we are recording all butterflies were recording, so hopefully getting information on on the trends and other species at the same time. Um, there are some that are there, there are several species that are out there at the same time, which makes it difficult for those who aren't well trained on. You have two seconds to identify a skipper on on a cone flower twenty meters away in the high prairie wind, <laughs> um, kind of a situation, but. Um, I don't think we exactly understand some of that. Um, a lot of them have pretty similar biology. They're also grass feeders. Some of them have multiple generations in a year, and that might be a factor um, that they're able to to just have a higher games number that they can play. Um, but things like the um, Tawny Edge Skipper is one generation a year at the exact same time. They seem to be doing OK. They've persisted out there. So we don't really understand that. That's a really important question. I saw Kale had raised his hand, and I want to make sure he had a chance to express something too. Oh, Kale, I'm sorry. I just stopped even looking at people raising hands. <laughs> My bad. Good job, Eric. Hi, guys. Thanks. Um, no, there's a couple of things I might just add to this conversation. So about the life history thing, I think that that's a great question because it can help us start to un better understand what's happening with Dakota Skipper. And a lot of what we're learning is very anecdotal, but there are some life history differences with the species that we see out in these prairie landscapes versus now what seems to be declining. So Eric mentioned uh, Tawny Edge Skipper, but also um, uh, Pleiades Mystic are two similar sized butterflies. They have a similar life history. But where we're seeing them on the landscape, it's at a much more micro scale, isn't quite the same as Dakota Skipper. So that might be informative and what flowers they're visiting are different. Pleiades Mystic also tends to be a little bit more of a low um, uh, uh, 
uh, hanging out in wetter spots than Dakota skipper. That's more of an upland species. But also looking at some of the other declining species that are still common out in Hole in the Mountain, like regal fritillaries. They decline from so much of their area, but they're still hanging out out there. Why would that imperiled species still be there versus Dakota skipper? And it may all have to do with their life history and getting at some of these pesticide questions that Eric was just talking about, where something like regal fritillary, they are not feeding um, as larvae late in the season when some of these aerially sprayed insecticides are being applied. So it might just be that they miss it. And why something like Powashik skipperling declined even faster. They might be more exposed on their grasses because they're not a shelter builder the way that Dakota skipper is or that Tawny Edge is. So I think that that's a great question that we need to be doing more work evaluating and not just, you know, Eric and I tend to be pretty hyper focused on Dakota skippers. We work at a zoo. That's how we met. That's how we do. <laughs> but yeah, fabulous question. Yep. Um, the other thing I was going to just mention before regarding Brandon's question about neonicotinoids that I was just also going to throw out there. Um, this was completely contrary to what we were expecting to see when we started um, this analysis and looking at pesticide residue samples at sites that Dakota skippers were still at versus sites that they'd re recently disappeared from. We had hypothesized that neonicotinoids, and based off of uh, a lot of the research and some of the other um, experts that we were discussing with at the time had assumed was that these things were going to be ubiquitous on the landscape. In the hundreds, if not thousands of samples that we've now analyzed, we found one, maybe two, Eric, we're at the two after one positive this year. Uh, um, <laughs> so at least in the sites that we're looking at, these are not the compounds that we're worried about um, severely impacting our uh, the pollinators. That doesn't mean that neonicotino neonicotinoids are not a serious local problem elsewhere and for other taxa, but they're not what we're going to be honing in on moving forward. Good work. Okay, I think our last question is going to be from Charles. It's a multi part that we're going to end with here. Charles, do you want to give voice to your question? Sure, I was just curious um, if there was any information or research on uh, survival rates for Dakota skippers that would be coming from a captive setting to the prairie where they're reintroduced. Um, and then secondly, um, do the models from the um, surveys that are taking place uh, for abundance um, take into consideration the low detectability of a Dakota skipper out there on the landscape. Yeah, I can take on the, that first part. That's Those are good, two good questions. And I think maybe Jess can take on the, the second part. Um, so yeah, we at the zoo, we're managing them just like you would do just like for a tiger or really any other any of the other zoo animals where we're, we're tracking lineages, we're trying to keep as detailed a notes of of the status of every individual as, as, as best as we can across all life stages. And so we have a we have inferences, at least in the absence of, say, predation or those kinds of things of what survivorship rates might be like. Um, but once we put them out there, um, we don't know. Um, we probably only expect a few percent of individuals or you know eggs that are going to be laid in the environment are going to survive to adulthood um we can get that uh, 40 50 percent at the zoo um and so we're able to produce a lot more than than otherwise but once they're on the landscape um because of their the cryptic nature especially of the larvae we have almost no information on on what the actual survivorship is at different stages and that makes it really hard to make some of these inferences Unfortunately. Jess, do you want to add to that? Sure. The So the second part of the question about uh, do the abundance models detect for or account for the low detectability? And that's the whole that's the whole idea of this type of um, distance sampling that we've been doing um, out there in this last year. It it estimates the detectability um, through the data and the modeling approach. So we used data from the wild population in Clay County as well as from the release sites in order to um, be able to get enough data to estimate that detectability and it was about 40 percent. Um, it's consistently been about 40 percent since we've been doing this type of sampling. So for you know only 40 percent of the time that a Dakota skipper is right in front of you, do you actually see it? 
good context. Thank you. Woo! We are at the end. Thanks for hanging in here for, I know, four hour virtual training, but we thought we were just going to go with it because we did videos, right? And you got the opportunity to have snacks and engage with these different panel participants. I just want to do a couple quick reminders here. So just a reminder that our recording will be available on the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative website. I have put um, that link into the chat. And then I also want to remind you to grab this evaluation link because we're in Teams and we did not take registration. Um, if you can just copy that link quick so that we can get an idea of how well we did today. If you want to see more things like this, if you want them shorter, you want them longer. Like, <laughs> how do you how do you want to do this so that we can make better trainings for you? Because that's one of our goals as part of the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. I would be incredibly remiss if I did not thank all of our partners and participants. And so again, thanks for being here. And I'm going to do my best to thank partners individually, which I always am terrified to do because then you always miss somebody and you feel horrible about it at the end of the day. But I'm going to go for it and I'm going to do it. So from our Prairie Reconstruction Initiative folks, just a special thank you to our Field Days team, Tom Skilling, Becky Esser, Paul Charland. And then of course, we wouldn't have been able to pull this off without the rest of our comm team, Jamie Ellis and Amanda McCoplin. With oh my gosh, I just said your name wrong. You know who you are. <laughs> then a very, very special thank you to everybody who got over their fears. Let me interview you out on the Prairie did the videos, you did excellent work. Um, our partnership team is Jessica Peterson, Amber Knudsen, Dustin Graham, Fred Harris, Mike Warland, Lisa Galvin Inver, um, Eric Runquist, Kale Nordmeyer, Kent Solberg, Nick Tuft, Jill Utrep, and of course, we have to thank Dan Ryder who put these videos together at my direction. And so it takes a lot to put up with me telling him, no, put this here. No, I want this clip here. No, not that clip, not like that. So I hope that you enjoyed them and that if there's stuff that you missed or if you had um, technological difficulties that you'll visit the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative website so that you get a chance to see those. And then I encourage all of our panel participants, if you saw some questions in the chat that we weren't able to get to, the chat is still available after the meeting. So if you're able to just spend a couple quick minutes typing into the chat the answers, that would be much appreciated. And so that is it. We're at the end, unless any of my PRI folks or panel folks, if you have anything else you, you want to say and sign off with. Good job, Megan. <laughs> Mutual. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, team. Appreciate you spending your Thursday with us. If you have follow up questions, oh, that's the last thing. If you have follow up questions, I am going to ask our panel folks to 